Hey everybody, welcome to St. Stephen's Online. We hope you enjoy catching up on our talk from Sunday. So we're thinking about the Lord's Prayer over uh, a number of Sundays, and I guess I sympathise with you if you've been a Christian for a number of years like I have, and perhaps you groaned a little inwardly when you were told we were doing a series on the Lord's Prayer. And you may well think, you know, is there anything else about prayer that I could possibly learn from the Lord's Prayer? And you know, as I thought about this, actually knowing isn't the problem, it's applying what we know that is often the issue. The Kellogg Company, uh, many years ago, ran a, a, a very successful television commercial um, for, their, for cornflakes. And in it, a man sits down for breakfast, he has a bowl of cornflakes, and then he looks up and he says to the camera, I'd forgotten how good they tasted. Now, the same thing actually happened to me just about three or four weeks ago. I had the munchies one Sunday evening, I think it was, after coming back from the six o'clock service, and um, I went to the, to the cupboard and I saw my daughter's Rice Krispies, and I hadn't had a bowl of Rice Krispies for probably two or three years. Anyway, I, I tucked in and it was like a revelation. I, I'd forgotten how good they tasted. And, you know, the same... It, the same thing, I think, often applies to prayer and the Lord's Prayer. Often we can forget just how good this pattern of prayer is that we're, fo- we're following. Or, even worse, we can just forget to pray and forget to apply it. Um, so, as we're looking at this particular passage tonight, let me just, uh, this morning, let me just put a bit of context together for you. A reminder here that this Uh, The Lord's Prayer here sits within Matthew's Gospel, and it is part of the Sermon of the Mount. Now, so for those of you that were here over the summer, you remember that perhaps we, um, we explored the Sermon on the Mount together over a number of weeks. And in fact, I spoke about the um, importance of not locating or storing treasures on earth, but storing our treasures in heaven and relocating our treasure in Jesus. And I think over the summer months, one of the things we learnt about why the Sermon on the Mount is so relevant in every generation is because actually it's about our heart motivation. It's about our posture and our belief. That's really what the Sermon on the Mount is addressing. So here in the Lord's Prayer, we are given a pattern. It is a pattern of prayer. And the pattern is this, is that the heavenly things must come before the earthly things. That's the pattern. We are to put the heavenly things first, but the earthly things always follow the heavenly things. And, you know, you know so that's what we're doing here. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. We're putting the heavenly things first, and then we move on to the earthly things. And, you know, actually, I think this is probably one of the reasons why our prayer life our personal prayer life can become weak and stunted is because we don't begin in heaven. We just move to the needs, to the give us our daily bread. You know, this is what I need. Whereas actually we should be focusing on those heavenly things first. Archbishop William Temple, he was the Archbishop of Canterbury from 1942 to 1944. He said this, he said that Christianity is the most avowedly materialistic of all the great religions. And what he meant by that, in fact, is that it says more about our bodies and our physical state than almost any other religion. Almost every other religion that you look at, if you study them, talk about our souls and getting those souls away from our bodies. Christianity is the only religion that emphasizes the body as something which God saves as well not only by healing, perhaps on occasions in this life, but by recreating it in the next life. The redemption of our bodies is part of God's plan for you and for me. Because Scripture tells us, actually, that these bodies that you and I are inhabiting this morning, they're temples, temples of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we have, in the Christian faith, we have a very high view of the body, of the physical condition. And And actually, this is why there's a high proportion of Christians in the medical profession as well. So therefore, when Jesus walked this earth, he wasn't just kind of offering out forgiveness in some kind of ethereal kind of way. He physically healed. He fed people, large numbers of people, 
on more than one occasion. He dealt with day-to-day -day needs. And give us today our daily bread is an utterly practical and down-to-earth petition. This is about practical daily needs of you and I, enough to live on, not luxuries or indulgences, fancy food, but the sustaining bread of life. And I want just to spend a few moments talking to you about bread. You see, because bread in the first century, I mean, they just did not think about it in the same way that we do now. I mean, there was no Atkins or keto diet in the first century. That, that, you know, nobody sat down and said, oh gosh, you know, that, that Atkins, diet, Atkins diet sounds great, but, you know, but I've got to steer clear of the bread. You know, I don't want to bloat. I've got to keep the six-pack six really tight, you know, that kind of thing. That, that was just not happening in the first century. In fact, the way that you and I actually think about bread, I think today, it's more of an indulgence and a luxury. I mean, I know certainly that Monday to Friday, I try not to have too much bread, and I save the bread for the weekend, and then go off overboard usually. <laughs> but you know how bread has become like a delicacy, and an indulgence. We have the artisan loaf, the artisan bakery, Gales, just down your road, or other bakeries of your choice. Um, now, now, the reason I'm saying that is because in the first century diet, meat was scarce, very scarce. If you lived by the coast, then you could get fish, but most of the diet was vegetables. Beef was a rarity, and pork, for obvious reasons, was a no-no if you were an Israelite. But ultimately, what kept you full all year round, 365 days of the year, was bread. Bread was essential for survival. It was not a delicacy, <clears throat> it was not an indulgence. It was a daily need if you were going to survive. So when we read, give us today our daily bread, there is a transition that is going on here. We move away from the heavenly in the first part of the prayer and we begin to ask God for something. Now, this might sound a little basic, but I want to remind you that Jesus is teaching us here throughout the whole prayer, but particularly in this section, about asking him, about going to him for, him, to, for things, about approaching him for our needs. He's saying, when you come to me, come to me this way. Ask the things. Ask, seek, knock, he tells us elsewhere. Now, as I've been preparing for this talk on prayer, it also always makes you reflect about your own prayer life. And I have to say, I think perhaps in every culture, it's diff every generation, it's difficult to pray. I think in this particular culture, it is also very hard to pray. We are constantly busy. We are constantly on the go. But prayer involves you and I slowing down a little creating space, halting our familiar pace. It feels odd at times, yes, and it doesn't help, you know, that we're surrounded by so many distractions from, you know, the chatter in our offices, gosh, the phones in our hands that are constantly distracting us and crying out for our attention, the screens in our homes, the hustle and bustle of our town and our city. And prayer is difficult. I mean, I give my wife and I as a classic example. For, for many years, for the first 20 years of our marriage, we had our own separate devotional time together. And um, we would only really pray together as a couple when there was a crisis, you know, some difficult situation um, we were facing. And, and it's only actually in recent years that we pray together, usually in the morning, four or five times a week, uh, just for five or ten minutes or so. And, you know, I, for, for me... And for us, that has really been a game changer in our marriage and in the way that we tackle the challenges of life and the difficulties of life. So if you're a married couple here this morning, or if you're dating somebody, or if you're perhaps living in a household with other Christians, you know, why don't you give it a go this week? I can tell you, you know, we spend so much time working on our exercise routine and our diet and our work-life balance. Let's get our prayer life balance right. And I, I can recommend it to you. Spend time praying together, particularly if you're a married couple and you don't do it. Take the time out. Yes, it feels awkward at first, particularly if you've been living together for 20 years already and you've not done it. But, but don't let that be an obstacle. Do it. You will not regret it. 
Prayer involves being still, seeking silence, seeking those moments, getting those moments to yourself where you can uh, come to the Father and be with him. Now, we live in a part of the country, and I would say a part of southwest London, and I've lived in this area all my life. We live in a part of London that idolizes three things. We idolize intellect, we idolize competency, and we idolize wealth. And that means, consequently, that we want to pursue more, to have more, and to be more. I've felt the pull of those things. I'm sure you have too. And here's the rub. Here's the rub. Because prayer involves you and I getting down on our knees before a mighty God and admitting we have nothing. And in fact, we are nothing without him. Jesus tells us to come to him as we are. Come messy, come needy, come like a child to a heavenly father whose, heart, whose arms are always open. So Jesus here teaches us to pray that God would give us daily bread. Now, obviously Jesus was not just teaching his disciples here just to pray only for bread, but bread was the staple diet of the Jews. It was also a powerful symbol and reminder of God's provision to them. It was in their spiritual DNA. So we remember, for example, how God cared for the Israelites when they were in the wilderness after the exodus from Egypt. And we remember, you remember how life in the wilderness was hard. They complained against God. They said, you know, we want to go back to the leeks and the garlic of Egypt. That was much better. Um, And in response to those complaints, God promised to rain down bread from heaven, Exodus 16, verse 4. And then the next morning, when the dew lifted, there remained behind on the ground a small round substance as fine as frost. It was like white coriander seed, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Gosh, that makes me hungry, just thinking about it. (laughs) When God miraculously fed his people from heaven, he did it by giving them bread. He could have done it in a number of other ways, but he chose to do it by giving them bread. And you know, it's interesting when we think about Western culture and the culture that we live in, sometimes, you know, one partner in the marriage or what is called the breadwinner, you know. We use that word bread as a synonym for, for money. Bread remains, remains, I think, in our language, a powerful symbol of the rudimentary basis of provision for, yours, for your needs and my needs too. And so this petition of the Lord's Prayer then teaches us to come to God in a spirit of humble dependence, asking him to provide for the needs that we have in our life and to sustain us from day to day. As I was preparing for this, I read uh, an article about uh, the, uh, there was a, a war in the 50s between uh, North Korea and South Korea. And as a result of this war in South Korea, there were a, n- a significant number of children who were left as orphans. And relief agencies came in to kind of deal this- with the situation and provide shelter and food and care for these children. Um, but as the aid, workers, uh, the aid workers noticed that the children were struggling to sleep at night. And as they kind of looked into it more and more, they discovered that the children had this great anxiety about whether they would have food the next day. And so to help resolve this problem, one of the relief workers in a a particular orphanage decided to give each of the children in that orphanage a piece of bread, and they put it in their hand and closed their hand up. And it was a reminder to them that the next day there would be enough food. They weren't supposed to eat it. They were just supposed to kind of sleep with it. It was a reminder that God provides that they would be provided for and likewise you know you and I should take the same comfort knowing that our needs are met if you are here this morning and you've been a Christian for many years look back look back think about the favor of God in your life surrounding you like a shield the the psalmist says God's provision to you and I daily for our needs so we are to come to God depending on him asking for him to provide for us day to day. We're not given license to ask for great riches or uh, extravagances, but to pray for daily needs. 
Now, as I've been thinking about the application for this, I mean, the application is numerous. Give us today our daily bread. Six words. The application is numerous, but let me just focus on a few things. First of all, we could underline the word us. Give us. It's not just about me. It's not just about you. Could you or I, this week, be the hands or the feet that answer that prayer for somebody else? Maybe that's a nudge for somebody this morning. Or maybe we should just remind ourselves that the bread that we eat, that we're gonna, or the food on our table at lunch, lunchtime today with the lovely vegetables, it doesn't come from the supermarket. It comes from the fields and the farms and the soil and the land which God tends and provides and uh, sustains. You know, I'm always reminded this time of year is when we usually have Harvest Festival. You know, and I remember days of old where there would be, you'd find out who the bakers in the church were with the fantastic loaves on the, on the table and who the, who the allotment owners were because there'd be the giant marrow and the squashes and all the other vegetables laid out, you know. But, and we'd sing that amazing hymn, you know, we plough the fields and scatter and, the, you know, the first verse, uh, the good seed on the land and it is fed and watered by God's almighty hand. It's, you know, the food doesn't just come from the supermarket, folks. It's a, it's a powerful reminder, I think, that, you know, that God does provide for us each day. And also, this prayer, give us today our daily bread, I think it teaches us to pray for basic things. And praying that way should actually simplify our lives. It should help us to focus on what we need and not just what we want, what we need. It helps us, I believe, to simplify. It helps us to live one day at a time. It helps us, in many ways, to live an uncomplicated life which I believe is what God wants for us. And therefore, I suspect, actually, that there is a very strong connection between simplifying our lives, between simplification and sanctification, that work, that ongoing work of the Holy Spirit that goes on with us who are believers. You see, sin complicates our lives. It complicates our desires. It confuses our vision. So the petition, give us this day our daily bread, helps us to reorder our lives daily so that we can live with simplicity before the face of God. It uncomplicates us. And that's, I think, also one of the things that will make our lives uh, reflect Jesus better to other people. And so maybe the other word here is daily. Now, if my understanding of Scripture is correct, and I I hope it is, I really do believe strongly that God has called us to live in periods of 24 hours. We've got, give us this day our daily bread. Uh, That wonderful verse also comes to mind from Lamentations. You know, God's mercies are new to you and me every morning. That means that God does not need to transfer them over from one day to the next. But today, on Sunday the 24th of September, his mercies are new to you and to me. Could you, if you don't currently, set aside time daily this week to pray to him, to thank him, to use this pattern, five or ten minutes, to bring your basic needs before him and watch him move in your life? You can use an app, you can set a reminder on your phone, you can use printed notes. There are so many resources available. As I close, I just want to make one final point And this is really focusing on, to my mind, one of the great mysteries of prayer is that we pray to God and yet he knows. He knows what we need. Look at verses 7 and 8 here. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. You know, some of you here this morning, and I think this has already come up in our worship, but some of you here perhaps need to be reminded that he knows. He knows the situation that you're going through. He actually knows better than you do. So we don't pray so that God is kind of bought in on the secret. You know, God, I'm just going to, you know, share this with you. But we express our dependence on him. That's, about the, that's the power of prayer. It's not so much about, you know, uh, 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 it's not so much about, it's about how it changes us. 
when we are praying to him. And so, you know, we pray to express our dependence on, on him, to remind ourselves, to humble our hearts, lest we can do it without him, which we can't, to remind ourselves of who God is, that he is the great I am, El Shaddai, all-sufficient one, to spread our need before him as children to their father, to lay hold of those mercies and those promises. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. I mean, that is amazing when you think about it. I mean, you're not just praying to get his attention. So therefore, you and I can surrender all our requests to his perfect wisdom. And you know, maybe perhaps sometimes what you think you need and what God thinks you need, they, they, they may be quite different things. Maybe there's something you're praying for at the moment and it just might be that God has quite a different idea of how it might work out and what you actually might need most. But rest this morning in the knowledge that your father knows and cares. So perhaps the parent here this morning praying for the wayward child or the single person praying for the job or the career person praying for a breakthrough in a particular project or, you know, I don't know, the mother with an uncertain future, whatever it is, rest in the fact that he already knows what you need. He knows. Let me bring in the Apostle James at this point. James 1.17. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Not some gifts, not the occasional gift. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. It's a reminder to me, uh, through preparing this, you know, that we are dependent on God for everything. You know, that breath we just took, uh, the blood that's flowing through our veins, the incomes we have, to every single mercy that you and I experience and are new every morning. We are acknowledging the giver, the one who provides. As I close, and I will close now, let me bring in the words of Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor, here's a, I've got a picture of him. Here, there he is. Amazing man. If you're going to read a biography of a Christian missionary, then this should probably be in the, he should probably be in the top five uh, of Christian missionaries. He was a mar- remarkable man who in the late uh, 1800s, he made it his life's work to go to China uh, to preach Jesus to the Chinese there. Uh, to places, in fact, where uh, Jesus had never been heard before. And uh, he founded a a mission called the China Inland Mission. Uh, It was a treacherous journey just to get there. It was six months by sea and by land to get there. And, you know, there was no internet, no Amazon Prime if you were stuck for some basics. There was no, you know, there was no mobile phones. And I think, actually, it's probably really hard for us to imagine what it was like back then to leave the relative safety and, and opulence of the UK and travel to a country that was so, so far away and then immerse yourself in a completely different culture. So I think we could say that Hudson Taylor knew a thing or two about depending on the Lord for daily necessities. And he once wrote this about his ministry. He said, I'm taking my children with me. He had ten, by the way. And I notice that it is not difficult for me to remember that the little ones need breakfast in the morning, lunch at midday, and something before they go to bed at night. Indeed, I could not forget it. And so I find it impossible to suppose that our Heavenly Father will ever forget his children. I'm a very poor father, but it's not my habit to forget my children. God is a very good father. It is not his habit to forget his children. He knows. He knows. And for those of us that have been Christians for quite a time, we can testify to that, can't we? We can look back can't we, and see that being true in our lives, that he knows, that he does provide, that he is our good father, that he has answered prayer for our food, for our clothing, for a roof over our head, and for so much more besides that. And I hope that this week, in our prayer lives together, that that would spur us on, that would spur us on as we face, go into another Monday together, as we go into another week, to pray day by day, 
Give us today our daily bread. Amen. Thanks for listening. We hope you found that encouraging. Have a great week and see you soon.